Well, ladies and gents, when hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11 and the PT-19 by Uncle Jack Simulations. This is part 3 of the video series, and today we're going to take a look at flying the aircraft around the traffic pattern of the circuit. We're going to do some touch and goes, and then a full stop landing at Cella, a Lillestrøm airfield in Norway. So obviously the aircraft is a tailwheel aircraft, and that means it's slightly different in landing than a nose gear aircraft. It's not too different, but we just need to be aware of the differences. In simple terms, the key difference is the relationship between the centre of gravity and the position of the main landing gear. In video 2 we talked about the centre of gravity and the centre of lift, but really for landing it's the position of the wheels that matter. Now, it's very straightforward. What we need to think about is the fact that the aircraft, if it's sitting on the ground, will always sit on all three wheels. And that doesn't matter if it's a Cessna 172 with a nose gear or the PT-19 with the tail wheel. Its natural resting attitude on the ground is on all three wheels. If you imagine landing the aircraft, if we try and land the aircraft on the two main gear, whether that's the two rear wheels on the Cessna or the two front wheels on the PT-19. As the aircraft descends onto the runway, the effect of that centre of gravity continuing downwards will essentially pull that third wheel onto the runway. It doesn't matter if that third wheel is behind the main gear or ahead of the main gear. But what does matter is the effect that has on the angle of attack of the main wing. So as the nose gear comes down on a Cessna, that has the effect of reducing the angle of attack, which reduces the amount of lift made by the wing. Whereas on this aircraft, as the tail wheel comes down, that has the effect of increasing the angle of attack and increasing the lift. Now obviously that means that with more lift the aircraft is more likely to keep on flying. So people will tell you that a tailwheel aircraft is more likely to bounce, whereas in actual fact it's really starting to fly again. It increases the angle of attack and the aircraft keeps on flying. There's two types of landing with a tailwheel aircraft. You can do what's called a wheel landing, where you land on the two main gear, or you can do a three-point landing, which, as it sounds, you land on all three wheels at the same time. Some tailwheel aircraft are not great at three-point landings. It has the effect of moving the uh, tailplane, uh, or the tail fin, I should say, out of the uh, directly out of the airflow, so that can reduce your rudder authority. And also, larger tailwheel aircraft, like the DC-3, can, it can place a lot of stress on the tail end structure if you three-point the aircraft and you get it slightly wrong. But with the PT-19 we can land the aircraft either wheel landings or three-point landings, and we'll try and look at both today. So approaching the field, uh, we're going to do a straight-in approach first of all. I'm going to check the aircraft using my kind of downwind check mnemonic. That's quite simple, it's going to check that the brakes for pressure and then brakes are off, so brakes are checked. The undercarriage is fixed down in this aircraft. The mixture is set to full rich. The prop is obviously fixed pitch. And the fuel, we've got more fuel in the left hand tank and we are running on the right tank. So that's okay at the moment, we'll change the fuel tanks on the first circuit. Brakes, undercarriage, mixture, prop and then fuel. It really is as straightforward as that. People tend to go overboards with their mnemonics or their checklists for things that don't really matter at that particular moment. My kind of rule of thumb is if you see a checklist with anything to do with aircraft lighting on it, then maybe it's not so much a checklist, but more an instruction guide on how to operate the aircraft. That's not a bad thing, but it's just important to understand the differences. For me, a checklist is something that affects you in the here and now something that affects the immediate safety of the aircraft. So we're going to position the aircraft for a straight-in approach to begin with. 
This sort of aircraft wouldn't normally do a straight in approach, especially without a radio. We'd have to fly overhead the airfield and look at the signal square, look at the windsock to work out which runway is in use. But at the moment, for the purposes of this demo in the sim, we'll fly a straight in approach. The airfield is directly off the nose at the moment. I'm going to track slightly to the right to establish on a long final. As we fly the pattern, we'll take a look at the various visual references around this airfield. I chose Chella specifically because there's good visual references on the downwind and on the base leg, but there's no pappies on the airfield, so we need to judge our approach profile uh, by ourselves. We can't use those visual aids on the runway. When flight instructors show their students uh, buildings to turn over and uh, things on the ground to look at to plan their circuit, that's really to help them consistently position the aircraft in the same place. What we want to do is to move on from that and try and develop some visual references using the aircraft structure and the runway so that we can land at any airfield. But for the time being, we'll just learn these references. Approaching the airfield just now, I'm going to make the car heat hot. I'm going to bring the power back to idle. And you can see the airfield is just there, just over the windscreen frame on the left hand side. So this U-bend in the river that's just off the left hand side of the nose at the moment, that's going to be our first reference. That's the point we're going to aim for as we turn on to base leg. All the approaches we're going to do, except the last one, will be done flapless. It's much easier to land the PT-19 without flaps. The flaps make it a fair bit harder because of how the how abrupt the transition uh, from flying to not flying is. With a flapless approach, we're going to make the approach at around about 90 miles an hour, coming back to 80 miles an hour over the threshold. You can see the runway directly ahead of us just now. And what I'm trying to do is to adjust the power to make sure that that runway stays in the same position on the windscreen. Now, I don't mean adjusting the pitch like this to keep it in the same position. I mean for a fixed pitch attitude, or a given fixed pitch attitude, if the runway is moving up the windscreen, then I'm flying too low or descending too quickly. And if the runway is moving down the windscreen, then I'm not descending quickly enough. So basically we want the aiming point on the runway to come straight towards us. And that's what I'm trying to do just by adjusting the power at the moment. It's a fairly shallow approach with uh, without flaps. If you find that you're not able to do the approach without flaps, it's worth going back to the first video and looking at uh, the idle speed adjustment. I adjust the idle speed so that the engine will come all the way back to 500 RPM on the ground. And that means in flight I get a really good uh, idle position. The, the aircraft is able to reduce the power to, some, to a low enough amount. I'm going to make the car peak cold now because I can easily make the runway even if the engine fails and I'm going to remember to look at the far end of the runway. I'm going to try and touch down in a three point attitude. So arresting the rate of descent and bringing the power to idle, holding the pitch and then slowly bringing the nose up until it's just above the horizon and we should touch down on all three wheels. Holding that stick back to the neutral position easing the power in and counteracting any swing on the nose. 70 miles an hour, climb, aim for 80, and I'll retrim and bring the power back and accelerate to 90 miles an hour just to provide better engine cooling. And it's as simple as that. If you're going to practice touch and goes, I strongly recommend not using flaps. The flaps just make it a little bit more difficult. If you want to do uh, repeated landings with flaps, it's best to stop on the runway, retract the flaps and retrim the aircraft. The reason being is that on a normal uh, flapless touch and go, your trim is roughly in the right position. But on a flapless, on a, a full flap, sorry, on a full flap touch and go, your trim will be out of position for the takeoff and you'll end up rotating off the, the nose, uh, sorry, off the tail wheel, which is not ideal.
At Cheller, we've got to climb ahead to 1500 feet before turning into the circuit. And that's quite a, quite a drag out here. If it was any other airfield, you'd normally turn left or right at around about 500 feet or so. But it's no big deal, it just gives us a little bit of time to think about what we're doing. So approaching 1500 feet, I'm going to look to the left and spot where I'm going to turn. I'm going to aim just for that uh, crest in the hills there. 1500 feet, I'm going to lower the nose and I'm going to bring the power back, roll and rudder into the turn. I'm going to use a slightly lower power setting than the previous two videos, about 1900 RPM. That should give me just under 100 miles an hour. So there's that hill that we marked for the crosswind turn. Looking to the left, yep, yeah, that looks good. And on the downwind, I'm going to turn to fly down the river on the left hand side. So round we go. And again, I fly with a twist grip joystick rather than rudder pedals, so I tend to use the rudder trim function rather than maintaining a constant pressure on the joystick. It's just a little bit easier than always holding that twist in position. So on the downwind leg, you can see the uh, river directly ahead of us. Just making sure it's all trimmed out. Touch on the low side, so I'll just put a fraction more power on. And then we'll do the downwind checks. So the brakes, check for pressure. Check they're off. The undercarriage is fixed. The mixture is on full rich, the prop is fixed pitch, and the fuel. There's more fuel in the left tank, so coming inside just momentarily, we'll select the left tank. The downwind checks are complete. So looking at that river over the nose of the aircraft, if we were another airfield that we didn't have a river, we'd need to use another reference. And the only reference we can really use at every airfield is the reference we bring with us, the airplane. And that's where having a cockpit that's a tandem, one seat behind the other, really helps. And it's even better when you paint stripes on the wings. You see the runway running down the, the center blue stripe on that wing, and if it was obviously the other side, we'd use the other side. But that gives us a very useful marker for how far away from the airfield we are. So a standard 1,000, 1,100 feet circuit if the runway is somewhere on the blue or red stripes, then we're probably in the right part of the sky. If the runway is much closer to us, we're too close in, and conversely, too far away, uh, too far out the wing, then we're clearly too wide on the downwind leg. That's obviously not great if you're flying a super low circuit or a super high circuit, but anything between 700 and 1700 feet should kind of work with that. It just means the higher you are, the further away you'll be. In a similar vein, we're going to look behind us and try and identify the spot to turn base. Now I said the bend in the river down here at the front left hand side would be a good aiming point. So to turn towards that, notice how the runway is now halfway between the tailplane and the main wing. So that's a good spot to turn onto base leg. I'll make the carb heat hot and I'll bring the power all the way back to idle. I'll correct the rudder position and I'll pitch and trim to maintain 90 miles an hour and then we'll roll in on the turn. Without power, with the power back at idle, the aircraft is quite sloppy in yaw, so don't be surprised if you get a lot of movement off the slip ball. That's to be expected. Pointing at the bend in the river, looking to the left to make sure it's a sensible base leg, and I'm flying fairly wide circuits in this aircraft just to give uh, time to talk about what we're doing. But you can obviously fly it uh, a little bit tighter if you want. There's a good position to turn on to final as well, just crossing that road. Round we go. And again, 90 miles an hour going back to 80 miles an hour. Simply looking at the position of the runway, whether or not it's coming up or down the windscreen. So it looks like we're maybe a touch on the low side. I'll put a little bit of power in, 
I'm going to make sure it's trimmed. I'm just going to help the speed come back to about 80 miles per hour. I could easily make the runway if the engine failed, so at that point I can make the car peak cold. And I'll remind myself now that in the final stages I want to be looking at the far end of the runway and not the aiming point. So just reduce the power, let the speed start to come back. Making sure that rudder is centralised. Power all the way to idle. Arrest the rate of descent. And just bring the nose roughly to the horizon. I sit down on the wheels and you can see it kind of oscillates a little bit. So for a wheel landing that oscillation is to be expected. I'll be very careful when I put the power in. Make sure I catch it with the rudder. Full power, 70 miles an hour. Rotate. Climb at 80. Just hold the pitch attitude. And then ease the power back to 2400 RPM and 90 miles per hour. So what happened is on a wheel landing, as we touched down, the vertical velocity of the airframe saw the tail lower ever so slightly and that caused the aircraft to get light on the wheels because it increased the angle of attack, we got slightly more lift and we got a little bit of oscillation. That's completely normal. But you've seen the two kinds of landings we can do with this aircraft. A wheel landing and a three-point landing. They've both got their purposes. One of the advantages of a wheel landing is you've got better visibility ahead and you also maintain a slightly higher airspeed. So if it's a gusty day, if it's a windy day, you'll have more control authority. And to be quite honest, some tailwheel aircraft prefer to be wheeled on some tailwheel aircraft prefer three-point landings. The biggest advantage you have on a three-point landing, uh, especially if you're landing on grass, is you get that tailwheel down really quite quickly and that has a stabilizing effect. On that wheel landing I had to be really careful putting the power in because the aircraft doesn't want to fly in a straight line. The aircraft wants to turn around its axis, it's pushing those wheels along not pulling those, uh, those, those uh, main gear along. So I've got to be super careful with the rudder. There's 1500 feet, low the nose, bring the power off. Check left, clear left, roll and turn. It's really satisfying um, flying this aircraft around. It's great for flying around the circuit because it's it, it never goes exactly the way you want it. The aircraft will always teach you something on every landing and that's a good hallmark of a, of a good trainer. Let's make this circuit a little bit closer to the airfield. We'll set ourselves up to be a touch on the high side this time. So turning on to the downwind and you can see that the previous circuit I aimed to fly down the river in this case, I'm just aiming over the city a little bit. On the downwind, check for brake pressure, check the brakes are off. Undercarriage is fixed, make sure it's fuel rich, prop is fixed pitch and the fuel. We've got uh, slightly more in the left tank and that's still sufficient for about uh, 3 hours total flying. So about 2 hours of messing around. Downwind checks are complete. I've recently added the X scenery, uh, X Europe scenery to X plane. It changes the look of the uh, autogen quite a bit. Quite like it. it. Looks a lot better, in my opinion. So here we are on the downwind. And we can see that if I just put the wings level just for a second, see that we're just ever so slightly closer. And let's just move the nose a little bit to the left so that we are a lot closer by the end of the downwind leg. So what I'm really looking at, I'm using the stripes as a reference, but I'm looking at the angle down towards the airfield. And it's all about judging the angles. One of the things that flight sims make really quite difficult is that uh, spatial perception. So we can use any little cheats we've got, like the stripes on the wings to help us out. 
What I will say is if you're flying circuits in an aircraft that's fitted with the G1000, although you've got that great visual aid right in front of you, it's important that you look out the window as well. If you're a sim pilot training to be a, a real world pilot, you want to keep your visual scan going as much as possible, because in the sim it's very easy to get fixated on the instruments. So just a little bit tighter in on the downwind than the previous flight. That's what we wanted. There's that bend in the river. I'm going to look over my shoulder for when the runway is uh, about halfway between the tailplane and the main wing. You see it's roughly the same place. I'm going to bring the power to idle, make the car heat hot. I'll just hold the altitude momentarily till I get to 90 miles an hour. Trim for 90 and roll and turn. So again, this is going to be a flapless approach. This will be the last flapless approach. I'm going to show what happens or what you can do when you get a little bit too high. You see, if it was a glider, we'd have spoilers to use as, um, as aerodynamic brakes, as speed brakes, to help us increase the rate of descent. But on an aircraft like this, we have an option as well. So I'm deliberately going to put a little bit of power in to keep the aircraft high on this approach. Not too high, just a little bit high. So hopefully you can see at the moment that we're a lot higher than the previous approach. We're on speed at 90 miles an hour. I'm going to close the throttle. And you can see that the um, the runway is too... We're, we're far, far too high looking at the picture. So what I'll do is I'll squeeze some right rudder and some left stick. So rudder all the way to the right and then just enough left stick to stop us from turning. So we're cross controlled at the moment. The rudder wants to turn the aircraft right, the ailerons want to keep it to turn it left and the net effect is we're flying straight towards the runway slightly sideways. That's increasing the drag profile and we're descending quite steeply. Now I can make the car peak cold, ease off the rudder, back to neutral rudder now and we'll aim for a three-point landing. Looking at the far end of the runway, I rest in the rate of descent, and then just bringing the nose up into that three-point attitude. And we're down. Stick to neutral, ready on the rudder, smoothly in with the power, full power, 70 miles an hour, and rotate. So you can see, even with a flapless approach into a touch and go, we're using a very small amount of that runway. This is a 1940s aircraft. It isn't really, it wasn't designed for the big airports that we have these days. We tend to think of a small airport these days of maybe having a, a 1,000 meter runway, a 3,000 foot runway. But these aircraft can operate on much smaller airfields than that. A lot of the training airfields were recently converted pastures or farmers fields during the World War II era. Airfields that don't have clear approaches, that are difficult airfields to get in and out of. And this aircraft has the capability of working into those airfields as well. But for smaller airfields we would need to use the flaps. Now we can use the flaps uh, for an idle descent, so bring the power all the way to idle and the rate of descent, or the angle of descent we get, will be really spectacular. But that's a very, very difficult landing, because one of the things the flaps do is make a lot of drag. And in level flight, we won't have the few seconds that we had on this approach to refine the attitude. It will bleed that speed off very quickly. So rather than do a full flap idle approach, I'll let you practice that yourself. We'll do a power on approach and we're looking for a precision touchdown just between the numbers and the first touchdown marker. 1500 feet, power just below 2000 RPM, roll and round we go. So the objective in this approach is to use the flaps to give us slightly more control over the uh, approach angle Rather than having to slip like we did on the previous approach, we'll simply use the flaps to produce more drag and fly the aircraft down that way. 
We know that it gives us the ability to fly a much steeper approach if we need to, but we also have to be aware of the increased risk of doing a full flap approach. These split flaps, as I said in the first video, are very good at producing drag, but they're not great at producing lift. So, in the final stages of the landing, it's almost all drag you're seeing. There's a slight reduction in the stall speed, so we can make the approach at uh, 80, slowing to 70 over the threshold. But that's, um, that's a secondary effect almost of the flaps. The primary effect is the excess drag. On an airliner, the flaps can get you almost 100 knots on the stall speed. Stall speed clean versus stall speed with full flap is about 100 knots. In this aircraft, it's 3 or 4 knots. It's really the drag we're interested in. On the downwind, we're going to check the brakes, pressure check the brakes, and then verify they're off. Undercarriage is fixed, mixture is full rich, prop is fixed pitch, and the fuel is on the left tank, which has got about the same amount of fuel as the right tank, still about 2 hours and 50 minutes of flight time. Checking left, looking where the runway is on the wing stripe, it's about the, the right location really, right position, tracking nicely on downwind. Obviously there's no wind in the sim today, but it's important to be aware of those wind effects as well. So point the nose of the aircraft into the wind and be aware of the effect that will have on your final turn as well. When you're turning final, if you find yourself getting blown through the center line, be especially careful not to put in a lot of rudder. It's a trap that a lot of student pilots fall into and it can be deadly. So if you're going through the center line, just concentrate on a moderate angle of bank, keep the aircraft coordinated and keep the speed, keep flying the aircraft. And if you have to, you just go around from it. But don't try and rescue a bad situation at low level because you can come unstuck very quickly. And this aircraft will bite you. The departure from controlled flight in this aircraft is fairly abrupt. So just looking for the angle between the uh, wing and the tailplane of the runway there, we'll start the turn in a few seconds. Obviously with full flap I could make the circuit a lot tighter because I can descend a lot steeper. But what I want to do is practice the landing and not necessarily the circuit. So there's power to idle, carpet's gone hot, and I'll hold the pitch until the speed comes back to around about 80 to 85 miles per hour, and I'll take the first stage of flaps. I'll then pitch down to maintain 80 miles per hour. So the white arc is where the flap limiting speed starts. It's 90 miles per hour on this aircraft. I roll onto the base leg. And you see we're flying more or less a standard profile. So once again, this is to practice a full flap landing, not necessarily an idle descent onto the runway. You can have fun with that yourself. Start a gentle turn onto the final approach track. So it's a bit counterintuitive. Why would you want all that extra drive just to have to put power against it? But there's full flap. And with the power coming up, I can make the car peak cold ready. We only need car peak hot at low power setting. So you could imagine that those trees on the undershoot of the runway are a lot taller, and we want to fly over those trees and then drop onto the runway. That's one of the reasons you might do a flap approach with power. Also, with a shorter runway or a shorter distance, we can obviously land on a much shorter field with those flaps as well. I just want to be very careful of the abrupt transition between flying and not flying. So we want to be careful reducing the power for the landing this time. And this is a full stop landing. So once the tail's on the ground, we'll ap apply the brakes and come to a halt. For a precision landing, the main trap is staring right at the touchdown zone and forgetting to look at the distant point on the runway. Looking at the far end, power to idle, bit of a bounce, hold the attitude, tail down and squeeze the brakes. We'll come to a complete halt 
and as I said if we just look down at the trim you can see it's quite far out of position so I reset it back to take off position and we'll bring the flaps up. So as I said flap, full flap landings on this aircraft are fairly difficult. You either get the thing into the three point attitude or you touch down on the wheels and in both cases uh, you're guaranteed a bit more of an abrupt arrival than you would be without flaps. Let's taxi off the runway and we'll take the aircraft back to the hangar. As I said on the first video, pilots flying this aircraft were training to fly much higher performance aircraft, things like Mustangs and, and the like. In the case of a bounce recovery, you've got to be very careful about putting in a lot of power, otherwise you can have a, a severe torque reaction. So it's better for a gentle bounce just to hold the pitch attitude, hold the power setting and let the aircraft settle back onto the ground. No harm done. In the next video we're going to take a look at uh, VFR navigation planning and uh, we'll do some cross country nav at the same time. I hope you join me for that video. If you do have any comments or questions please feel free to leave them in the comments section. I always do try my best to respond to any comments you put in there but it can take me a few weeks to do so. Thanks very much for watching the video and uh, do take care. I hope you join me again soon. Thank you.